in today's video I'm going to be talking about rackets and specifically how having the right racket with great strings is much more important than having the most expensive or the lightest racket. We're going to be talking about general racket design, my thoughts on string tensions, and we're going to finish with a self-coaching point that uses the racket. So if any of those things are of interest, hopefully all of them, stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, so rackets. So let's just talk about rackets today. First thing I want to tell you is that I am no longer uh, sponsored by any particular racket company. I have no affiliation. I'm not here to promote any particular brand or denigrate any other particular brand. All of the things that you'll hear me say today are my opinions, my thoughts. Second thing to tell you is that I was the squash promotions manager for Dunlop Slazenger in the UK for a number of years. So I do have a bit of experience from behind the scenes, shall we say, from the manufacturing, the business point of view. It doesn't make me an expert by any means, and things have changed uh, in, in the years since I was out of squash. But I've kind of got, you know, the, the coaching uh, experience of holding rackets and hitting rackets, but also, you know, selling them and promoting them. So, you know, I wanted to sort of start with that. So let's look at, this is a racket obviously. And of course if you're watching this you know what a racket is. I'm not here to tell you what a racket is. Just a, some, some general pointers. First of all, this is a, what we would call a closed um, racket in the sense that the head has a piece across here. Now the other type would be an open racket um, where the strings would go much longer. In general, the longer strings make it feel like that it's more powerful, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, it's more to do with other things than whether the strings are long, otherwise you just have silly long strings. You've got the beam, which is the width. The width, generally the wider the racket, um, the stiffer it is. Not always, because it depends on its materials and its construction, but that, that would be one guy. And nowadays, I've got a number of different rackets here. Nowadays they're pretty much all the same. It's hard to, if I were to just put them all together, You've got very slight differences. I know you probably can't see that. You've got very slight differences here. It's more to do with its construction than it is to do with anything else. In fact, you can see that the cheapest one, which I'll talk about maybe later, is the biggest. <clears throat> this piece of plastic at the top is called the bumper guard. It's there to protect the strings from the frame and the frame from the wall. And I'll just point over there, but it could be anywhere. And of course, if you're one of those players, it's there to protect the racket against from your head. Uh, then you have these pieces down here which are called the grommets. These protect the strings from the fray because otherwise the fray would cut it. All right, and then of course you've got the, the grip. Now when it comes to the weight of a racket, um, manufacturers generally remove the, uh, grom uh, the bumper guard and the grommets and the grip as well probably and they weigh it like that. In some cases they might even take away the paint before they paint it. It doesn't have much but it might be like half a gram or a gram and that might make it enough to um, to call it a 110 or a 109. Uh, don't feel bad for the manufacturers, they do what every other manufacturers do. They try to promote it, they spin it in a way that's good for them. Just like car manufacturers will remove everything they can from a car and, and put like a, a, a couple of litres of petrol or diesel in the car. I mean they don't put cannonballs in the back of the car and make everybody, like five people sit in the car to get their um, consumption figures. They manipulate it as much as possible and racket manufacturers do the same. But more importantly, the weight of a racket is not what you should be doing, worrying about. And in general I feel that squash, the squash community, um, like I feel about uh, fitness, which was my last video, the squash community is focused way too much on the lightness of the racket. And they should be focused, in all, focused on the balance and the strings. If you really want to learn how much a racket weighs, hold it like this. Holding it like this doesn't tell you how much it weighs, it tells you its balance, which we'll talk about in a moment. So if you want to compare two rackets, I don't know how far you can see, but I would hold them down here. And I would find this very difficult to tell you which is heavier. We are not, we be in squash players, we are not practiced enough to be able to tell the difference between 105 grams, 115, 130. We can't, well, maybe 130 to 105. We can't tell small differences. It's just, it's just too difficult for us. What we can tell, though, is how a racket feels. Now, let's talk about the balance point. The balance point for this particular racket is, is about here. 
particularly scientific test. You've got three types of racket balance. You've got head heavy, medium balanced, and head light. Now, what's important about that is that a slightly lighter racket, in this case, maybe this one, this one is a very, uh, quite a light racket. I don't know how much it weighs, actually. I'm not sure I even knew. Maybe 150. This is a cheaper Dunlop racket. This is a Harrow racket. And um, this is heavier, but this is head light. So if I were to hold this one, and you see players doing this because that's sort of the way you get the feel for it, and I was to hold this one, this definitely feels lighter. And it feels lighter because there's more weight in the shaft, there's more weight near the handle. So what's important if I pick these two up is how it feels. I'm not suggesting that you have to have a headlight racket. What I want you to take away from this video is that you should find what works for your game. Don't think that having the lightest racket is a panacea for all of your squash problems. Just because it's lighter and you might be able to flick it out of the corner, you've still got the problem of not having good technique. Light rackets are like plasters over cracks. They stop it from, you think that you've solved your problem, but you haven't. Good technique, early preparation are much better than simply buying a lighter racket. Now, of course, if you've got lots of money, I'm very happy for you, and you go out and buy the most expensive rackets, great, no problem. But it won't necessarily help you improve your game. Experiment. Experiment by trying lots of different rackets. Find out what you like. You might like a head-heavy racket. Now, I'm sure you want me to say to you, oh, head-heavy rackets are good for this type of player, or head-light rackets are good for this type of player, but it's not that simple. It's partly to do with your swing, it's partly to do with your forearm strength, it's partly to do with how much spin you've got on the ball and how much you feel the racket. I, and it's taken me a long time to figure this out, I prefer slightly heavier rackets that are either evenly or preferably head light. Evenly balanced or head light. Now, here's a good example. I have two identical rackets, both given to me by my friend. My friend, not the manufacturer, I didn't get these from the manufacturer, my friend gave them to me. He moved on to better brackets. These two are identical, both strung with uh, Techni Fiber, which we'll talk about strings in a moment. And I didn't realize, but one always felt better than the other. And I can never really put my finger on it until I realized that this one has a second grip on it. This one doesn't. For some reason, the grip was missing, so I just put one grip on top. Whereas here, it had the grip, so I put it on top. And I didn't even think about it. I was in a rush. So I've been playing with these two rackets, and I didn't realize why this one felt better. I thought it may be because it, the grip is slightly bigger, and I prefer a slightly bigger grip. But then, when I sort of did the balance, this is slightly headlight, and it feels better. So, that brings me on to grips. Some people replace the grip immediately. Other people put one on top. The grip can change the balance and the feel of a racket significantly. You could buy yourself the most expensive, the lightest racket, suddenly you put a grip on it, and it feels even lighter, and you think, oh, this is even better. But not necessarily. Or you can get yourself a slightly head-heavy racket and put another grip on, and it becomes lighter. Now, it sounds like I'm confusing the issue, and it's certainly not my intention. But what I'm trying to get across here, what I'm trying to communicate, is don't buy light rackets just because you think that the pros play with light rackets. The pros can play with anything. And back in the day, when I was there, the pros played with what we told them to play with, within reason. They can play with any racket. A pro doesn't stay with one particular manufacturer because they love that particular racket. They stay with that manufacturer because they've got a good relationship with, with the, the people that work there. They get paid for it. I am almost certain that if a racket manufacturer came along and talked to your favorite player who's been espousing how this racket is the best they've ever played with, and they offered them 10 times as much money, they would change. And that is not a criticism. I'm not judging them for that. They are professionals. They need to earn a living. Having more money from your racket manufacturer makes your life a little bit easier. It means you can train in you know, different ways, in different places, with different people. Manufacturers will pay people to play with rackets, so don't think that be, excuse me, because your favorite player plays with this brand and this model, that you playing with it will suddenly make you like that. If only it were that simple. Professionals can play with a wide range of rackets. And that's 
one thing that I'd like you to take away from uh, professionals is that you should practice playing with lots of different rackets. If you can, ask as many people, can I borrow your racket for a hit? Obviously, be careful when it gets to the wall, because you don't want to you know, damage it or anything. But play with as many different rackets as you can. Try and put out of your mind, oh, this is expensive or this is cheap. Find something that feels good to you. I'm very happy with both of these rackets. If somebody offered me the, the top of the range, Prince or Dunlop, I would say no, because I prefer to have two rackets the same. And that's important for me, having two rackets that I can interchange to between any time. And in fact, one day I play with this, the next time I go on court, I play with this. And I rotate them. That, for me, is a better way. Two rackets that are good rackets are better than one very expensive racket, because if that breaks, you're going to be in trouble. Having two rackets is a mentality. It's a professionalism. I'm prepared for all situations. Okay, enough about rackets. Talk about strings. When a manufacturer brings a racket into the country, that's called landed. The landed price is how much it costs to purchase it and have it, you know, not purchase it because it, in many cases it's their own factory, but not always, and to get it to come into the country, let's say the UK. The difference in price between getting it at the frame or getting it strong was in many cases less than 50 pence. Okay, so it's a long time ago, so let's call it a pound. All right, a pound. The strings that come with most rackets are terrible, terrible. In this case of the Harrow, no. It comes with uh, Asherway. Asherway is a good brand. I love Technifiber as well, but I'm very happy with Asherway. Yes, okay, so I'm showing you a, a string that's broken, but it took a lot of beating before it broke. First thing you want to do is you want to uh, change the strings on most rackets, unless they're high quality, separate brands. All right. What you need to do is you need to find out the tension that works for you. So this is where I'm going to be talking about string tension. There's a, uh, I'm going to call it a belief, but it's probably stronger than that. There's a belief that the lower the tension, the harder, uh, the harder you hit the ball. The higher the tension, the more control that you've got. I completely disagree with that. I don't know if there's been any tests with some kind of robot swing and a stationary ball that measures the speed of the ball with lower and higher tensions. If there has, send me the link because I want to read it. In my experience, lower tensions give me more control. And the people who talk about the, the higher speed, they often use the, 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 um, the analogy of a trampoline. Well, for me, that works the other way. The longer the, the ball is in contact with the string, the more control you have over it. If it comes off very quickly, you've got less control. That's how it seems to me, and my experience is that I have lower tensions. That's important for me because it means that it puts less stress on the frame. Less stress on the frame means I'm less likely to break a racket. And that's important to me as well, especially if I have to play for them. In the past, when I've got three rackets back, it doesn't matter. Now, most rackets are strung between 25 and 28 pounds, and what that means is that if you sort of, if you put this in the frame of a stringing machine and you took the string, it kind of essentially, you put a weight of 25 or 28 pounds, that would be the tension. Not that it can hold 25 or 28 pounds, but that's it. And that's about, I don't know, 13 kilos. My rackets are strung at 10 kilos, which is about 22 pounds. And I recommend that you try different types of tensions. I know that's going to be expensive in, in the short term. I'm not suggesting that you get a racket strung, you test it for like you know, a month or something, and then you cut the strings out. You obviously try it and you find out what works. Now, one of the problems is, and it's getting more and more complicated, this video, is that different tensions work better with different frames. So I tend to, when I find a frame that I really like, I keep using that frame for as long as I can. I don't get a new one just because a new model's coming. Now that was easier in the past because I would have 20 or 30 rackets at home and yeah, okay, now I can't. But unless somebody comes along and says, Philip, here are you know two beautiful rackets, I'm not going to change these rackets. I'm not going to go out and buy the latest racket. I'm happy with this. Probably my game would improve a little bit if I bought a slightly more expensive racket, but I'm comfortable. I'm not thinking of constantly changing my racket all the time because I think it might help me. I focus on the things that I can control things that I can improve. So, buy good strings. Try different tensions in your racket over a period of time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I've got two of these. I strung these at the same tension. Well, I had them strung, 
sorry, I can string, but I don't anymore. I have them strung at the same tension, but you might want to try, if you've got two rackets that are the same, you might want to try slightly different tensions. I recommend buying a good string. This string is Technifiber, Technifiber 305. It's the thickest you can buy, this is 1.2. If I could have, I would have bought the 1.3, which is the tennis string. I used to play with tennis strings, and the philosophy behind that was, the thicker the string, the more contact with the ball. Now I know lots of players like thinner strings, and high tensions, but I'm sort of against that. I'm in the opposite direction. And what I'm trying to get you to do is I'm trying to get you to experiment. Find out what works for you. So let's summarize what we've been talking about. We've been talking about rackets. Don't buy the lightest just because it's the lightest. Don't buy the most expensive just because it's the most expensive. Buy a racket that feels comfortable to you. Forget the weight. Remember, you won't be able to feel the weight. Think about the balance. You can try open or throat, uh, closed throats. I have no closed, uh, open throats here with me today because I don't have it. Um, that doesn't mean I'm against them. I I've had some fantastic open throat in rackets, but I just happen to have closed throats at the moment. Find the, the, the racket head shape that works for you. Find the balance. Some people like head heavy. Some people like medium, medium balance. I like head light. prefer to have a slightly bigger grip. Um, and I prefer lower tensions, thicker strings, and very good quality um, strings. That's important. So we've covered the weight, the balance, the strings. Now the type of strings, of course, is the manufacturer. Generally, Asherway, Technifiber, there might be a couple of other manufacturers that I don't know about nowadays, but um, in general, don't use the ones that come with the, the racket. Tension, experiment. And in fact, let's talk about that. Um, go to a specialist. Don't go to your local big shop. Go to a specialist racket manufacturer. And while we're talking about that, uh, there's a channel called PDH Sports, which is Paul Hargrave. Uh, Paul knows a lot about rackets, so if you're particularly interested in particular racket brands, go visit his channel. There'll be a link in the um, in the description. He talks more about um, particular. He reviews rackets as well as other things. He's an excellent player, so he understands that. We disagree on racket tension, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that he's going to give you some fantastic advice. So if you're looking for sort of reviews on rackets, that's the place to go. But go find a specialist. Go find, I mean, in London, there's a few different places with more sports. Israel Geffen and those two people, those two shops have got years of experience with, with rackets and frying things and strings. Um, so go and see a specialist. But don't just get it done in your, you know, your local sports shop. Buying a machine and learning to string is actually quite easy. It's not, it's not hard. But getting, you know, 20 years of experience behind you is important. So go see a specialist. Just like a coach, you know, you wouldn't just go and see some a tennis coach who can maybe help you with your squash because he saw it on telly or something. You go and see a specialist, and that's important. All right. So I want to finish with um, self coaching. You might have noticed. But on this racket, there's a little bit of masking tape. Now this is an area of the racket that's not exactly wasted. I mean, how can you waste an area of the racket? But I'm going to come a little bit closer. I'm not sure how close I can get. And what you'll see here is that, I'll sort of put it to the side, is I put uh, a thin piece of masking tape on this particular racket. And I've written on it, watch, intention, game plan. As you know, that's my mantra. On the other side, I've got just a game of squash. And that was because when I came back after my 13 years and I started playing again, I played in a couple of tournaments, I was so nervous. And I have no idea why. I've played the World Open, I've played the British Open a number of times. I've played in some big tournaments. And I was never more nervous than when I started playing in like little local tournaments. Um, so it was to, just to remind me, it's just a game of squash. There's no reason for my heart rate to be 130 before I even go on court. Why am I so nervous? You can use this little area. I meant to bring some tape and put some on here. I mean, you can just sort of put a little bit of tape here. It doesn't have to look beautiful. Don't worry about it spoiling the, the uh, balance or anything. It's not going to do anything like that. Uh, and in fact, actually, what you can see here is I've got number one because I had two of these. And the, the frame broke on that one after a long time. And when this when this string broke, I, would give, I was given the other two. So I haven't sort of restrung this one. But I've got them numbered so that I knew which one I was playing with each time. So this is a, just a little idea, I'm not suggesting it's going to change your game, but we often forget the things that we've been doing, and because I made that mantra video, people have been sort of writing that they've changed theirs. Well, put this on here, and what it, what it does is, just when I sort of bounce the ball, just as I'm about to serve maybe, I just 
look at it and it reminds me of what I should be doing in this particular game. It reminds me not to get too nervous. You can put anything you want on there. You can put something to get you motivated. No boasts or never give in. Be ruthless. Hate your opponent. Okay, not specifically, but, but something that just reminds you. And that's why I call it kind of like self-coaching because it's just reminding yourself all of the time. And it's just there and you might only look at it once or twice a match. But it might make a difference in one point. And sometimes one point makes all the difference in a match. So there we go. So just a little idea I've had over the years. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. No problem. So anyway, thanks for watching. And remember, do something every single day to improve your squash. But that doesn't mean just buying expensive rackets. Buy the right racket. Thanks for watching. See ya. Hello. In today's video, we're going to be talking about... Son of a gun.